Good evening. Thank you for joining me here. I'm delighted and grateful for this occasion. As a cardiologist in full-time clinical practice, I am repeatedly discussing the topics of fat and cholesterol with my patients and how that relates to atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, also known as hardening of the arteries, refers to the appearance of fatty plaques within the arteries of our heart, which may cause heart attack, or the arteries of the head and neck, which may cause stroke, or within our extremities, which may result in claudication, which refers to, to the development of leg pain when walking. At first glance, this topic may appear quite straightforward. However, this subject matter is also highly nuanced in terms of clinical presentation and patient management with fascinating and very elegant biochemistry at a basic science level. So my presentation is titled, A Cardiologist's Perspective on Fats, Cholesterol, and Atherosclerotic Cardiovascular Disease, or ASCVD, Understanding Your Risk and How to Harness the Protective Benefits of Omega-3 Fatty Acids. I'm on social media. Please follow me to enjoy all my content because so much more is in the works. It's always James Canaller MD, all one word. My website is jamescanellermd.com. I'm on Facebook as James Canaller MD, and the same is true for YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Let me give you an insight into your cardiologist's point of view. Here's what your cardiologist is thinking during your office visit especially when they are meeting you for the first time. We immediately notice whether you are obese. We then ask ourselves, does this patient have atherosclerosis or cardiovascular disease in any vascular distribution, in the heart, head and neck, or extremities? If the answer is yes, this is known to be true, the next question is about severity, and our focus will be on how to control and hopefully reverse your cardiovascular disease. If the answer is no, or we don't know, we then try to estimate your risk of developing atherosclerosis. This is based on your risk factors, starting with your age or family history of premature cardiovascular disease. We then consider your other comorbidities, such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, or the presence of inflammatory conditions such as arthritis or fibromyalgia. Your stress levels and fitness routines are also very important. If you have any concerning symptoms or if there is sufficient clinical concern, we move on to testing. With a blood draw, we will obtain your cholesterol panel and perhaps markers of inflammation such as CRP. It's possible to do more advanced lipid testing beyond your basic cholesterol panel. However, the additional information such testing provides doesn't yet change our management decisions. We may then order functional testing where we look for the effects of atherosclerosis in your heart. That means stress testing on a treadmill if you are able or using medications to simulate exercise always with ECG monitoring and sometimes with myocardial perfusion imaging to assess for any blood flow limitation that may manifest during exertion due to the presence of an obstructive plaque or blockage. We can also look for anatomic blockages, see any plaques that are present and narrowing the arterial lumen, such as with a CT scan to assess for coronary calcium or a more detailed CT angiogram or a more invasive diagnostic angiogram, recognizing that any blockage we see may require the functional testing to understand its significance. And again, we are evaluating for the presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or ASCVD. As this figure illustrates, fatty deposits can occur in the arteries of the heart, which may lead to heart attack. Any chest pain resulting from blood flow limitation to the heart, which classically occurs during exertion, is called angina or anginal chest pain. Fatty deposits can also occur in the arteries of the extremities, resulting in limb ischemia. Pain resulting from blood flow limitation to the extremities, which also develops during exertion, is called claudication. Claudication indicates risk for distal infarction or tissue death beyond the site of blockage. 
Atherosclerosis of the head and neck is also very concerning as this may result in stroke. While the presence of atherosclerosis may be quite subtle, obesity or fatness is usually obvious. And we cardiologists are very preoccupied with fat. The obesity epidemic and all of its consequences are constantly in front of us. Obesity is defined by your body mass index or BMI. BMI is used to screen for weight categories that may lead to health problems. Your BMI is calculated as your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height measured in meters. BMI measurement has been validated for both men and women over the age of 20 and is a reliable indicator of body fatness for most people. A BMI less than 18.5 is considered underweight. A BMI 18.5 to 25 is considered normal or healthy weight. BMI 25 to 30 is considered overweight and a BMI greater than 30 is frankly obese. BMI greater than 35 is morbidly obese. And obesity is always dangerous. The longest living and most disease-free societies on earth are never obese. That said, obesity has some short-term advantages. Obese individuals may have stronger bones and more muscle mass, which results from carrying around the extra fat. While your BMI may tell us if you are fat, it says nothing about the composition of fat within your body. It doesn't tell us if you've been eating too many bad fats, such as trans fats or saturated fats. Neither does it tell us if you're eating enough good fats, like monounsaturated fats or polyunsaturated fats. Those are the omega-3s and omega-6s. Your BMI can't tell us if your omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is properly balanced, which has dire implications for the degree of inflammation throughout your body, another risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Finally, your BMI says nothing about your cholesterol profile, which probably informs the most about your risk. So beyond definitions of obesity, what we need to understand about fat is far more nuanced. We've all heard references to saturated fats, unsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats. These are distinguished by subtle differences in biochemistry, which have dramatic implications for our health. At the molecular level, fats are basically long carbon chains with an abundance of hydrogen atoms attached to the central carbon chain. The fat is called saturated when as many hydrogen atoms as possible are bound to the carbon chain. That carbon chain is saturated with hydrogen. This means that only single bonds are connecting the carbon atoms. This is true for the fat molecule next to the number one. The white balls represent carbon atoms attached in a row. Each carbon atom is capable of four attachments, which are occupied by as many hydrogen atoms as possible, shown by the orange balls. The fat is called saturated when double bonds exist between some of the carbon atoms. Every double bond between carbon atoms reduces the number of attached hydrogen by two. The fat molecule is said to be unsaturated since it's possible to add more hydrogen. The fat is called monounsaturated when only one double bond is present within the entire carbon chain. A monounsaturated fat is shown next to the number two. The fat is called polyunsaturated when two or more double bonds are present within the carbon chain, meaning the fat is unsaturated in more than one location. A polyunsaturated fat is shown next to number three. A triglyceride is formed when three fat molecules are grouped together by a special carbon chain known as a glycerol backbone. Fats within the bloodstream naturally form triglycerides. A single triglyceride can be made up of saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats, as is shown here. The glycerol backbone is next to number four. The seemingly minor differences between fat molecules have profound implications for our health. Your cholesterol panel includes the level of triglycerides within your bloodstream. 
Your triglyceride levels reflect your unused calories from carbs and proteins in your diet, which are converted to fat and stored, adding to your BMI. The different types of fat have been classified as good or bad for our health. At the outset, it's important to realize that industrialized food processing will convert good fat into bad fats. This is the case with the omega-6 polyunsaturated fats and will convert bad fats into infinitely worse fats, as is the case with processed trans fats. That said, bad fats are thought to include trans fats and saturated fats, while the good fats are unsaturated, both polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats. Let's begin with the bad fats, the trans fats. The reality is that trans fats come in both natural and artificial forms. Natural trans fats occur in dairy products and meat from ruminant animals, that is, animals that chew their cud, such as cattle, sheep, goats, and deer. They form naturally when bacteria in these animal stomachs digest grass. Interestingly, this is the category of animal that the ancient scripture declared to be clean meats, that is, fit for human consumption, and see texts in Leviticus chapter 11, which dates back to 1000 BC. Even though these animals are a source of trans fats, this should be a major clue that these might be a healthier choice of meat. Artificial trans fats are the problem. These are very different and far more deadly. Artificial trans fats are created in industrial processes that add additional hydrogen to liquid vegetable oil, making them more solid. This industrial processing is called hydrogenation. We call these partially hydrogenated oils. The term hydrogenated means that we have artificially added hydrogen atoms to the carbon chain of fat molecules that was otherwise unsaturated. These industrial trans fats are less likely to spoil and therefore have a longer shelf life. That's commercially valuable, but bad news for our health. Suspect trans fats when you see pastries or baked goods sitting out at room temperature without spoiling. Some restaurants usually use these partially hydrogenated vegetable oils in their deep fryers because it doesn't have to be changed out as often as other oils. Artificial trans fats are so unhealthy that the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, has recently prohibited food manufacturers from adding artificial trans fats to foods and beverages. The FDA projects that this alone will prevent thousands of heart attacks and deaths every year. Let's recognize the overlapping and confusing terminology between quotes good and quotes bad fats. For example, Trans fats are actually unsaturated fats, a word used to describe healthy fats. The difference is the orientation of hydrogen atoms attached to the unsaturated segments of the carbon chain. The trans fats have trans double bonds, meaning hydrogen atoms are arranged on opposite sides of the carbon chain, distinguishing them from healthy unsaturated fats, which contain cis double bonds, meaning the hydrogen arrangement is adjacent or on the same side of the carbon chain. The trans double bonds creates a straight carbon chain, whereas cis bonds result in carbon chains that are bent. That difference, the fact that trans fats contain straight carbon chains, is responsible for the adverse health effects of trans fats. It's important to recognize that trans fats are not cholesterol, but they do impact your cholesterol profile. Eating trans fats tends to increase your LDL or bad cholesterol while reducing your HDL or good cholesterol, thus increasing your overall risk of suffering a heart attack or stroke. Saturated fats are mainly animal fats and long considered to be unhealthy. It's easy to recognize saturated fats because they are typically solid at room temperature. They're found in fatty meats, butter, cheese, full cream dairy products, and in the skin of poultry, which is why you're often told to never eat the skin from chicken or turkey. Palm oil and coconut oil also have high amounts of saturated fat. 
Unsaturated fats like olive oil tend to be liquid at room temperature. As we discussed earlier, a fat is said to be saturated when the central carbon chain has as many hydrogen atoms attached as possible. This means that there are no double bonds between carbon atoms. Only single bonds are present since all the double bonds became saturated with hydrogen. It is this saturation with hydrogen ions that makes the fat solid at room temperature. In contrast, unsaturated fats will contain double bonds within the carbon chain. The less than maximal attachment of hydrogen atoms allows these fats to be liquid at room temperature. Once again, subtle molecular differences with dramatic implications for your health. And saturated fats aren't always unhealthy. In fact, saturated fats fulfill an important niche in our diet. A good example of this is ghee, which is derived from cow's milk. Ghee is made when cow's butter is heated low and slow and then strained to remove all the milk solids, becoming a lactose-free anti-inflammatory superfood high in a substance originally called Factor X. Studies by Dr. Weston Price dating back to the 1940s provide the remarkable backstory on Factor X. These are fascinating to read. Dr. Price traveled the world to study indigenous cultures, trying to establish why their members had perfect jaw structure and perfect teeth with no cavities, despite never brushing their teeth. He called that key ingredient in their diet Factor X and determined that it must be coming from the milk of cows that were grazing on rapidly growing fresh green grass. We now believe that factor X is vitamin K2, which is central to bone health. We've all heard that omega-3s are so good for us. The recommendation to eat a heart-healthy diet rich in omega-3s is almost cliche. It turns out that the omega-6s are also essential, while the very beneficial oleic acid found in olive oil is actually an omega-9 fat. Omega-3s and omega-6s are polyunsaturated fats, meaning they contain multiple double bonds within the central carbon chain, whereas the omega-9 found in olive oil is always a monounsaturated fat, meaning that only one double bond is present. The term omega simply refers to the location of the first double bond in the chain. When the first double bond occurs after the third carbon atom, it's an omega-3. When that first double bond occurs after the sixth carbon atom, it's an omega-6. And when the first double bond occurs after the ninth carbon atom, it's an omega-9. These differences seem trivial, but the implications for our health are profound. Omega-3 fatty acids are the most important of the omegas. Omega-3s possess many powerful health benefits for your body, heart, and brain. In fact, few nutrients have been studied as thoroughly as the omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s are heart healthy as they improve on risk factors for cardiovascular disease. They prevent arterial hardening and reduce blood clotting within the arterial lumen. Omega-3s reduce inflammation and the metabolic syndrome in general. Omega-3s also impact your cholesterol profile. Omega-3s can lower your triglyceride levels by nearly 50% while slightly raising your HDL or good cholesterol. Some of the healthiest diets on earth, such as the Mediterranean diet, contain abundant omega-3s. Omega-3s are also brain healthy. They fight depression and anxiety, promote brain health during pregnancy and early life, reduce symptoms of ADHD in children, improve a variety of mental disorders, and fight age-related mental decline and Alzheimer's disease. In addition, omega-3s combat autoimmune diseases, improve eye health, improve bone and joint health, prevent cancer, improve asthma in children, reduce fat in the liver, improve sleep, are good for the skin, and alleviate menstrual pain. Good sources of omega-3 fatty acids include salmon, sardines, mackerel, with excellent plant sources being algae, as well as walnuts, chia seeds, beans, broccoli, and cauliflower. Omega-6s are also considered essential for our diet. Healthy omega-6s are obtained from grains and cereals, meats, and dairy. 
The omega-6s improve heart health while lowering your risk of stroke and early death. Omega-6 deficiency may cause arthritis, kidney damage, hair loss, dry eyes, and dry skin. The omega-6s also impact your cholesterol profile, reducing both LDL and total cholesterol levels in your blood. Although necessary for our health, we get far too much omega-6. This is because omega-6s are primarily found in vegetable oil, which are used heavily in virtually all processed foods. When fat terminology is used without context, labeling certain types of fat as healthy or harmful is confusing. For example, a saturated fat obtained from unprocessed whole foods is healthy. On the other hand, a saturated fat that was manufactured during the industrialized process of hydrogenation is unhealthy. Unprocessed omega-6s are obtained from vegetable oil, such as corn oil or soya bean oil, or from seeds and are essential for our diet. However, vegetable oils are widely used in food processing, and consequently, industrialized societies are overexposed to omega-6s. Our overexposure to omega-6s relative to our intake of omega-3s is unhealthy as it results in inflammation throughout our bodies. Trans fats are automatically considered harmful. This is because most trans fats are highly processed and used to prolong the shelf life of baked goods. Let's remember there are naturally occurring trans fats that can fill a meaningful niche in our diet. Two fats that are always healthy the terms omega-3 and monounsaturated fats, which are omega-9s, are never used to describe unhealthy fats. Once again, the monounsaturated fats include olive oil, avocados, and most nuts. Let's focus a little longer on the omega-3s. Again, there are three omega-3 molecules of interest, EPA, DHA, and ALA. The most potent are EPA and DHA, found in fatty fish, with algae being the only plant source. The omega-3 found in all other plant sources is ALA. ALA is less potent, but with proven cardioprotective benefit. A small amount of ALA is converted to EPA and DHA in your body. Excellent sources of ALA include walnuts, chia seeds, and flaxseed. Other plant sources of omega-3s include beans, broccoli, and cauliflower. When obtaining omega-3s from fish oil, the small, short-lived pelagic fish are the best sources. These include mackerel, sardines, and anchovies. Being small and short-lived, these fish are least likely to accumulate toxins such as lead and mercury from the ocean. Pelagic means these fish don't live too close to the ocean floor or to the surface. Larger fish, such as tuna and salmon, are also excellent sources of omega-3s, but feed on these smaller fish and therefore are more likely to accumulate toxins. Once again, algae is the only plant source of the two omega-3s found in fish oil, EPA and DHA. This makes an organic seaweed snack so attractive. I'm buying these from Costco. Salty and crunchy, but these can get stuck between your teeth. Still, a great source of the two most potent omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Once again, the omega-3s found in all other plant sources is ALA. ALA is less potent, but with proven cardioprotective benefit. A small amount of ALA is converted to EPA and DHA in your body. However, the benefits of ALA are not dependent on this conversion. Excellent sources of ALA include walnuts, chia seeds, and flax seed. The abundance of omega-6s in processed foods is why the Western diet provides a high amount of omega-6s and far too little omega-3s. We eat far too much bread, chips, cakes, biscuits, cookies, and margarine. The result is an omega-6 to omega-3 imbalance. An omega-6 to 3 ratio of 1 to 1 is ideal for our health. Achieving a ratio of 3 to 1 is excellent. Omega-6 to 3 ratios as high as 25 to 1 are common in Western countries and contribute to our high rates of chronic disease. 
In general, we need to eat more omega-3s while limiting our intake of omega-6s. An ideal omega-6 to 3 ratio in the blood is 1 to 1. However, achieving even a 3 to 1 ratio is admirable and acceptable. This means moving towards a Mediterranean-style diet with plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables, nuts, and beans. Use extra virgin olive oil as a salad dressing, dipping oil, and for cooking. Fish is the preferred meat source with one to two servings per week. Substitute chicken occasionally. Red meat is limited to once per month. And all processed foods are out, including processed flour, refined sugar, white bread, chips, pastries, candy bars, and any other processed food. We recommend the Mediterranean diet because it has been studied rigorously with convincing demonstration that this diet is truly heart healthy, particularly when nuts and olive oil are included. This landmark paper, Primary Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease with a Mediterranean Diet, supplemented with extra virgin olive oil or nuts, was finally published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018 after first appearing in 2013. If you're not familiar with the terminology, primary prevention means that individuals without known cardiovascular disease were studied and that the Mediterranean diet was shown to prevent the development of recognizable heart disease or any vascular disease with a result that is statistically meaningful. So the study compared a typical low-fat diet with a traditional Mediterranean diet divided into two focus groups. Group 1 consumed 30 grams of nuts daily, consisting of 15 grams of walnuts, 7.5 grams of almonds, and 7.5 grams of hazelnuts. Group 2 consumed plenty of extra virgin olive oil. Participants were given 1 liter per week of extra virgin olive oil with instructions to consume at least 4 tablespoons daily. The study included men aged 55 to 80 and women aged 60 to 80 with no known cardiovascular disease but with diabetes or at least three other risk factors including smoking, hypertension, high LDL or low HDL, obesity, or a family history of premature cardiovascular disease. This was a large study with 2,500 participants in each group. The figure on the right shows the occurrence of major cardiovascular events, including heart attack, stroke, or death from cardiovascular causes over five years. For both the nuts and extra virgin olive oil focus groups, there was a large and matching reduction in cardiovascular events compared to the control diet. The benefit of consuming nuts on a daily basis is not surprising as this is one of the nine principles of extraordinary longevity reported for the blue zones. Walnuts are the highest nut source of omega-3 fats, being 8 to 10% ALA by weight, while nuts in general are known to contain monounsaturated fats, the same type of fat found in olive oil. It's time to introduce the topic of cholesterol. Cholesterol is a waxy, fat-like substance. Cholesterol particles float through the bloodstream and are found throughout your body. Cholesterol has many useful functions, including cell membrane support, as well as the production of hormones and vitamin D. Cholesterol can be devastating, forming deposits within the walls of blood vessels, which may grow to completely occlude the vessel, or suddenly rupture, resulting in pathologic blood clotting with instantaneous complete occlusion of the affected vessel. We see here that the cholesterol molecule consists of carbon rings, reminiscent of the Olympics, and this is very different from any of the fat molecules we've discussed so far. Most of our cholesterol is produced by the liver. It's true that when you eat foods containing cholesterol, that cholesterol levels in your bloodstream will rise. However, the liver simply responds by making less cholesterol. And then, if you eat less cholesterol, the liver reacts by producing more. So how does your liver decide what cholesterol levels to maintain in your bloodstream? We know that atherosclerotic plaques develop at the sites of vascular injury, which occur in the setting of increased vascular shear stress, such as with hypertension or psychological stress. Vascular injury may also result from inflammation caused by the unhealthy aspects of our diet and our toxic exposures. In light of this, high cholesterol levels and atherosclerosis actually represent your body's attempts to repair damaged arteries. 
your liver is maintaining the cholesterol levels needed to respond to vascular injury, but with devastating consequences. Cholesterol actually travels through the blood clumped together with triglycerides, forming large floating conglomerates that are marked with very specific protein tags. These protein tags, called lipoproteins, identify the cholesterol particle as LDL, or as bad cholesterol. LDL is bad since LDL transports cholesterol from the liver to the peripheral blood vessels, resulting in the deposition of LDL particles within the walls of our blood vessels, which can then accumulate into obvious atherosclerotic plaques. Other lipoproteins define HDL, or good cholesterol, which transports cholesterol from peripheral blood vessels back to the liver, which shrinks the atherosclerotic deposits. In short, we want our LDL to be as low as possible and HDL as high as possible. Here we see a traditional cholesterol panel as we routinely obtain from our patient's blood work. The unit of milligram per deciliter is used in the United States and easily converted. Standard measures include total cholesterol level, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, and LDL cholesterol. It's also useful to report the cholesterol to HDL ratio. High cholesterol levels with low HDL will increase this ratio, indicating higher risk. We see that a high risk profile includes total cholesterol greater than 249, triglycerides greater than 200, HDL less than 35, and LDL greater than 160, with a cholesterol to HDL ratio greater than 6. We'll talk about foods and medications to lower cholesterol, which are strongly indicated for high-risk individuals. Even though the liver seems to act autonomously, certain foods do lower LDL cholesterol. Many of these are familiar from the Mediterranean diet. Olive oil, whole grains, avocados, beans, nuts, spinach, soy, citrus, veggies, dark chocolate, and green tea. It may be that these foods decrease inflammation and vascular injury so the liver is able to reduce cholesterol production which would otherwise be needed to repair the damage. It's true that many individuals can dramatically lower their LDL by changing their diet. For others, LDL changes very little regardless of how strict the diet reform. As a result, many folks in our society appropriately require prescription medications to lower their LDL. This widespread need for lipid therapy is better understood in terms of a condition known as familial combined hyperlipidemia, with at least 2% of the population meeting diagnostic criteria and with many others likely affected by some variant of this condition. This is a genetic predisposition to high cholesterol and cardiovascular disease resulting from as many as 500 different genes. The affected individual and their first degree relatives may have elevated triglycerides or high LDL cholesterol or both. With familial combined hyperlipidemia, there is a family history of high cholesterol and cardiovascular disease, which is made worse by comorbid conditions like hypertension, diabetes, hypothyroidism, or alcoholism, to name a few. These elevated lipid levels in a milieu of inflammation and other risk factors results in progressive plaque deposition in the arterial walls. These may be asymptomatic until 90% occlusion is present, or until a partially occlusive plaque suddenly ruptures, allowing a blood clot to immediately form, resulting in sudden, complete occlusion and heart attack. We are left with the fact that one in three adults has high cholesterol, and these elevated cholesterol levels are primarily determined by our genes. Over 500 genes may be contributing, and it's common for individuals to express one or several culprit genes, either partially or completely. This genetic predisposition to high cholesterol, also called familial combined hyperlipidemia, is due to overproduction of LDL by the liver. Triglycerides are also elevated, and HDL tends to be low. These individuals tend to develop premature cardiovascular disease. Overall, familial combined hyperlipidemia is responsible for 10% of heart attacks in those under 60 years of age and 40% of heart attacks overall. This figure illustrates the categories of medications used to lower cholesterol and their sites of action. Since the liver is the site of cholesterol production and metabolism, it's no surprise that the majority of medications are active in the liver. 
The statins, PCSK9 inhibitors, and bempedoic acid are all active in the liver. Statins are the most commonly used class of medications and are most effective in lowering LDL cholesterol. Statins block the synthesis of cholesterol in the liver and can lower LDL by 40 to 60% while also lowering triglyceride levels and raising HDL. There are two high-intensity statins, a torvastatin or Lipitor and rosuvastatin or Crestor, which lower LDL the most while raising HDL more than the other statins and also lower triglycerides as effectively as the fibrate medications. For those intolerant to statins, we now have PCSK9 inhibitors such as Repatha, which is taken twice monthly as an injection. These drugs block the breakdown of LDL receptors by the liver so that more LDL receptors are available to remove LDL from the bloodstream. As a result, the liver absorbs more cholesterol, lowering LDL in the blood. The PCSK9 inhibitors are as effective as the statins in lowering LDL cholesterol, with Repatha lowering LDL by 55-60%. to 60%. Most recently, we have Bempedoic Acid, or Nexlatol, which blocks cholesterol synthesis in the liver, but by a different mechanism than the statins. Bempedoic acid is often combined with azetamibe, which is available as Nexlazit. Both Nexlatol and Nexlazit are ideal for patients intolerant to statin therapy. They can be used in addition to the highest tolerated dose of a statin or in isolation. Azetamibe, also known as Zetia, inhibits the absorption of dietary cholesterol at the brush border of the small intestine, thereby blocking the contribution of dietary cholesterol to cholesterol levels in the bloodstream. Azetamibe is frequently combined with statins and with bempedoic acid for additional LDL lowering when needed. The fibrates act by increasing the uptake of triglycerides from the peripheral blood while reducing the production of LDL and increasing HDL production by the liver. The fibrates are particularly effective in patients with high triglycerides, low HDL, or diabetes. Compared to the statins, fibrates are less effective in lowering LDL, but much better at boosting HDL levels. Fibrates are often used in patients who don't tolerate statins and should never be used in conjunction with statins. Gemfibrozil or Lopid and Phenofibrate or Tricor appear equally safe and effective. Phenofibrate is more convenient since it's taken once daily rather than twice daily, but generic gemfibrozil is substantially less effective. Statin therapy is first line for LDL reduction. It's important to identify which individual should be taking a high-intensity statin. Notice there are only two high-intensity statins available, a torvastatin or brand name Lipitor, and rosuvastatin, or brand name Crestor, and both should lower LDL by 50%. Notice that both of these become moderate intensity statins at lower doses. There are substantially more moderate intensity statins, which become low intensity statins at lower doses. These are useful for individuals not requiring high intensity statin therapy, but still needing some correction of their cholesterol profile. High-intensity statin therapy is indicated for four classes of individuals. Number one, anyone with established cardiovascular disease age less than 75. For those age above 75, a moderate-intensity statin can be substituted. Number two, anyone with an LDL level greater than 190. Number three, anyone age 40 to 75 with diabetes, regardless of LDL levels. This guideline highlights the importance of diabetes as a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Number four, anyone aged 40 to 75 years when their 10-year risk of developing cardiovascular disease exceeds 7.5%, and there are risk calculators to establish this risk. A moderate intensity statin should be used for those with LDL greater than 160 with expected LDL reduction of 30 to 50%. And for LDL greater than 130, when a positive family history of coronary disease or when other risk factors are present. We've talked about the importance of omega-3 fatty acids with fatty fish being our major source of EPA and DHA. Given this information, we would expect that fish oil supplements are heart healthy. Fish oil is very effective in lowering triglycerides. However, multiple clinical trials, scientific studies evaluating fish oils have failed to demonstrate a convincing benefit. 
The evidence simply does not show that fish oil prevents the development of cardiovascular disease or reduces the incidence of cardiovascular events, such as heart attack or stroke, in individuals with established atherosclerosis. This may be due to poor product quality, inadequate dosing, or to the finding that DHA in fish oil may actually increase LDL levels. After a series of negative studies involving fish oil, a very high quality fish oil supplement arrived named Lavaza. It may be that previous studies were disappointing because they were using low quality product or inadequate dosing. Things may be different with Lavaza. Lavaza is a pharmaceutical grade prescription fish oil, the highest quality supplement available. Each capsule of Lavaza contains one gram of product with at least 900 milligrams of omega-3s that's 465 milligrams of EPA and 375 milligrams of DHA or 55% EPA overall. The manufacturer recommended dose is 4 grams or 4 capsules per day. Like other fish oils, Lovaza is effective in treating severely elevated triglycerides, even levels exceeding 500 milligram per deciliter. Lovaza reduces triglycerides by as much as 44% while lowering total cholesterol by 10% as well as other cholesterol particles. Lovaza is often used in place of fibrates to lower triglycerides because Lovaza, like all fish oils, can be used with statins. Unfortunately, Lovaza has been found to increase LDL cholesterol by 10 to 46 percent depending on the study. This is concerning since LDL or bad cholesterol contributes to cholesterol plaques and cardiovascular disease. For this reason, there are safety concerns surrounding the use of Lovaza. Despite the high expectations, clinical trials evaluating Lovaza have been disappointing. Lovaza was evaluated in the ASCEND trial, published in the American Heart Journal in 2018. This trial studied diabetics aged greater than 40 who took Lovaza 1 gram daily over a follow-up period of 7.4 years. At this dose, which is only one quarter of the manufacturer recommended dose, Lovaza provided no meaningful benefit in reducing heart attack, stroke, or death over more than 7 years of follow-up. Lovaza was also evaluated in the VITAL trial, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2018. This trial studied men aged greater than 50 or women aged greater than 55 who also took Lovaza 1 gram daily for over 5 years. Once again, Lovaza showed no reduction in heart attack, stroke, or death from a cardiac cause over more than 5.3 years of follow-up. Despite the major study endpoints failing to meet statistical significance, those taking Lovaza did have a 28% reduction in risk of heart attack. In particular, there was a 77% reduction in heart attack among African Americans, suggesting that Lovaza is uniquely beneficial for this ethnic group. From these studies, we can only conclude that fish oil supplements do not prevent adverse cardiac events in individuals with no known heart disease. Some may argue that the dose was too low or that a longer follow-up period was needed. Perhaps future studies will address these limitations. The promise of fish oil was restored with the arrival of Vasipa. Vasipa is another pharmaceutical-grade prescription fish oil derivative which contains only EPA. Each capsule of Vasipa contains one gram of icosapentethyl or EPA. Like Lovaza, the manufacturer recommended dose is 4 grams daily. So how do Lovaza and Vasipa compare? Again, Lovaza contains both EPA and DHA as are present in fish oil, whereas Vasipa contains only EPA, which is isolated from fish oil. Lovaza achieves a greater decrease in triglycerides, but unfortunately increases LDL. Triglyceride reductions are less with Vasipa, however, LDL levels are unchanged. Vasipa is therefore considered safer for cardiac patients. The manufacturer recommended dose for both is 4 grams daily. Vasipa was evaluated in the Reduce It trial, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. Vasipa was studied in patients with established heart disease and in those at increased risk but without known cardiovascular disease with the dose of 4 grams daily for both groups, higher than prior studies with Lavaza. Vasipa was proven to lower cardiovascular risk, 
Specifically, heart attack, stroke, need for coronary revascularization, such as with stenting, and hospital presentation for cardiac chest pain in those with established heart disease and high triglycerides being greater than 150, or simply to provide meaningful risk reduction in patients with diabetes and other cardiac risk factors, regardless of triglyceride levels. In the REDUCE-IT trial, VASIPA increased serum EPA levels by a whopping 386% over one year. Benefit was similar and large regardless of the initial EPA levels. Patients who attained the highest EPA levels on treatment also experienced fewer hospitalizations for new heart failure. In addition, higher EPA levels predicted a lower risk of sudden cardiac death and cardiac arrest. The higher the EPA level achieved, the better. Interestingly, the SEPA therapy decreased DHA by 2.9%, underscoring the lower relative value of DHA for heart health. Who should take the SEPA? Based on the REDUCE IT trial, we have these recommendations from some of the world's leading medical societies. The American Heart Association, or AHA, recognized that Vasipa is the first non-LDL-focused therapy to demonstrate cardiovascular benefit, and that's huge. The AHA recommends that Vasipa is first-line therapy for patients with known cardiovascular disease and diabetes when triglycerides remain greater than 135 despite maximally tolerated statin therapy and lifestyle changes. The European Society of Cardiology specifies the full dose of 4 grams daily in their recommendations, stating that Vasipa is appropriate in those with known cardiovascular disease and elevated triglycerides despite statin therapy. The American Society of Clinical Endocrinologists also specifies the full dose of 4 grams per day, recommending Vasipa for patients at risk for cardiovascular disease without requiring the presence of established cardiovascular disease. Although the REDUCE-IT trial included a subset of patients without high triglycerides, all three major societies specify an elevation of triglycerides in their appropriateness criteria for Vasipa. We've reviewed two supplemental fats to protect against cardiovascular disease, both with robust scientific support. The first was extra virgin olive oil. From studies of the Mediterranean diet, consumed in large doses at least four tablespoons daily, which is about 60 grams. The second was EPA, a potent omega-3 derived from fish oil, which is taken at a dose of four grams daily. How can we incorporate adequate omega-3s into our diet or supplement regimen? The REDUCE-IT trial established the importance of omega-3 levels and cardiovascular health. You may not exactly fit the study cohort from which the positive results were derived. However, it's likely that you and other individuals outside the study population would experience similar benefit. Still, most of us don't qualify for prescription fish oil products such as Lavaza or Vasipa. Extra virgin olive oil is widely available, although product quality can be tricky. Is there a good option for you and me, and can these be combined? I have chosen a commercially available omega-3 product called Balance Oil provided by a Scandinavian test-based nutrition company known as Zenzino. Balance Oil from Zenzino is a blend of high-grade fish oil and extra virgin olive oil. The fish oil is derived from small pelagic fish like sardines, anchovies, and mackerel, and is rich in both EPA and DHA. The olive oil is from Spain and selected for its very high content of polyphenols. Based on my weight, I take three teaspoons of balance oil each and every day. Now let's compare balance oil to the major clinical trials using dose recommendations for a 175 pound individual, since the recommended dose of balance oil is based on body weight. For an individual 175 pounds, 2.5 teaspoons daily is recommended, which contains over 5 grams of omegas. This is more than the 4 grams per day recommended for both Lavaza and Vasipa. Balance oil also contains 65% EPA, while Lavaza had only 55% EPA, making balance oil a little more like Vasipa in this respect. The total dose of EPA and DHA is 2,500 milligrams, which is slightly more than half of the 4 grams daily recommended for Lovaza. 
However, the dose of balance oil provides more than twice the dose of EPA DHA used in the clinical trials evaluating Lovaza. You're getting more than twice what the study populations received. The daily recommended balance oil also contains 4.3 grams of extra virgin olive oil. This combines the benefits of olive oil with fish oil, which helps to preserve and protect the bioactivity of the fish oil. Now, this is substantially less olive oil than the four tablespoons, which is about 60 grams of olive oil used in clinical studies of the Mediterranean diet. So there is plenty of room for additional use of extra virgin olive oil for salad dressing, dipping oil, and cooking throughout your day. Very conveniently, Zinzino also provides an extra virgin olive oil called Revolutionary or Revo. Revo is a cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil that contains 30 times more bioactive antioxidants than regular olive oil with an acidity level of less than 0.4%. Revo allows you to maximize your intake of natural antioxidants, vitamins, and nutrients that are literally bursting in olives. Revo is among the very best with forest green color, grassy peppery flavor, and fruity aromas being your irrefutable indicators of quality. Based on over 250,000 tests, we know that only 1% of the population in North America has an omega-6 to 3 ratio of at least 3 to 1. Those taking an omega-3 supplement have an average ratio of 16 to 1, while those not taking an omega-3 have an average ratio of 25 to 1. Nutritional science recommends that you maintain a ratio of 3 to 1 between omega-6 and omega-3 essential fatty acids. So how will you get there? 95% of those taking Zinzino balance oil have a ratio near 3 to 1 after 120 days. This will probably be true for you. The Zinzino program provides a blood test measuring your omega-3 levels and omega-6 to 3 ratios. The test kit provides a lancet to prick your finger. You then drip some blood onto the cardboard and send it in using the envelope provided. It's suggested to perform the test at the start of your balance oil program and after four months of use at the recommended dose. You can see how your omega levels improve. Just take the test, then swallow two to three teaspoons of balance oil daily for 120 days or four months, and then repeat your blood test. 95% of consistent users achieve a ratio near 3 to 1. So here is what several months of taking balance oil can do for you. Here we see results for a 75-year-old man with history of diabetes, cardiovascular disease with prior heart attack, heartburn, and arthritis, who began with an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 28.4 to 1, which improved to 2.6 to 1 after 5 months of use, for which he reported relief of symptoms and better control of diabetes. My initial results were quite shocking to me as I was taking two fish oil supplements and using extra virgin olive oil from Gundry MD. My initial omega-6 to 3 ratio was 12.6 to 1, so quite deficient, and I'm anxious to repeat the test after four months. So far, I've noticed much better skin and improved vision, as well as better concentration and focus. The recommended dose is based on your body weight. The formula is 0.014 teaspoons times your body weight measured in pounds. So for example, if you weigh 110 pounds, it's 1.5 teaspoons daily. If you weigh 150 pounds, it's 2 teaspoons daily. And 220 pounds, it's 3 teaspoons daily. For my weight, my daily dose is 3 teaspoons per day. I use the convenient measuring cup from Zinzino to measure my morning dose of balance oil. The oil tastes great. It's not fishy at all. So we look forward to experiencing the benefits of recommended omega-3 levels and ratios. These include healthy brain function, healthy heart function, improved immunity, and reduced inflammation throughout our bodies. As always, follow me across social media platforms for more fantastic content. If you would like to try Balance Oil, please use the link below this video. This offer includes discounted pricing. Please share your experience with us. I love to hear your stories of massive success.